Cause everything you say is life to me I don't wanna miss one word you speak So quiet my heart, I'm listening victory and defeat I've had problems big as planets turn to pebbles when you speak I've had nothing to my name never lacked for anything cause you were there with me you've been my savior sustainer when I'm at my end my healer you pay when I wander far away you keep calling out my name you don't give up CC, let's stand this morning and sing together. Feel free to put your hands together today. Come, let us worship our King. Come. 
come let us bow at his feet he has done great things see what our savior has done see how his love overcome he has done great things he has done great things oh here of heaven, you conquered the grave. You free every captive and break every chain. Oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive. Oh Jesus, our Savior, your name lifted high. Oh God, you have done great things. You'll be faithful forevermore. You have done great things. And I know you will do it again. For your promise is yes and amen. You will do great things. God, you do great things. You conquer the grave, you free every captive, and break every chain, oh God, you have done great things. We dance in your freedom, awake and alive, oh Jesus, our Savior, to name lifted high, oh God, you have done great chain oh god you have done great things we dance in your freedom awake and alive oh jesus our savior your name lifted high oh god you have done great things you have done great things oh god you do great Welcome to CCC, whether you're in the gym, you're online, or you're right here in this room. Well, I just want to take a moment and welcome you to our outdoor, <laughs> indoor, <laughs> wild, jamble of things service. And if you would rather look at your neighbor and look kind of confused because Roddy told us to look at our neighbor and told us we weren't going to be here in this building last week. <laughs> The confusion is settled. I'm so glad to see everybody. Everybody, it's a kid in here. I just want to say hi. Can you say hi to me, please? Hi. Ooh. Hi. Thank you guys for joining us in this service. We're so glad to have you here. And would you join us um, in continuing worship as we sing the next song? Come on, let's celebrate him this morning. See the tomb 
Where he lay, see the stone rolled away. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. See his hands, see his feet, touch his scars and believe. He is risen, he is risen, he's alive. He took all our shame. This is our testimony this morning. You took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven. Oh, we're forgiven. The work forever done, only by the blood. It is finished. Oh, it is finished. Took all our shame, left it in the grave. We're forgiven, oh, we're forgiven. The work forever done, only by the blood. It is finished, oh, it is finished.
God is faithful, His promise is true. So I speak to the mountains, oh, it's time to move. My God is bigger, better, stronger, greater. Come now. 
This is my confidence. You've never failed me yet. Yes, Lord. You never failed me yet, God. And you never will. Lord, you never, ever will fail us. Leave us or forsake us. There are mountains in our lives. We can speak to those mountains, God, but it must be hard sometimes when there's things in our path right now, in our way. And church, I just want you to think about a mountain that is in your way right now, just an obstacle that you have to overcome. Maybe it's with your home life or your financial situation, with disease or with a family member who's unsaved. Think about something that you think and it's okay to think this, that you think in your mind it, it's, into, it's too impossible, it can't happen. Because we're finite beings. We're, we are not capable of even understanding what God can do. But God has already moved mountains in our lives. And if not in our lives, maybe in the lives of those around us. And maybe if even not there, maybe we can look to scripture about the ways God has moved those mountains. So think about a time, whatever your situation is, if you're dealing with finances, maybe money's tight, think about a time that God moved before in your finances. If it's sickness, illness, think about a time that God healed. Or think about how Jesus touched the blind, the deaf and the lame, and restored health. So think about those moments today, church because he's faithful. He's faithful. And Paul says in one of his letters to the churches, he says, even up until now, God has been faithful and he has not failed me. So he hasn't failed us yet. And that word yet can be tricky. It can mean many things, but in this instance, it means up until now, to this point, he showed his faithfulness. So why wouldn't we believe him for the next mountain? Amen? You're faithful, God. You're faithful and true. And we praise you for all the wonderful things that you've done. We praise you for the, all the wonderful things that you will do in our lives. And we'll see those mountains moved, and we'll see them moved again. We thank you, and we praise you, Jesus. We celebrate you this morning, and we worship you today in spirit and in truth.
the blazing sun shall pierce the night and i will rise among the saints my gaze transfixed on jesus face come on fix your eyes on jesus this morning just take a moment to worship on your own without words Fix your eyes, cast your eyes on him today. He's worthy. He's lovely. He's beautiful. Worship him today, church, in your own voice. We just praise your name, and Lord, we recognize that all of creation points to you. Lord, you change the calendars. Everything we do points back to the day that you died for us. But not only did you die, you came back to life, and you live. And for that, we praise your name for what you have done for us. We ask all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. I just want to let you all know that you have been heard. Uh, those of you who have been expressing to me the concern that we chose to come inside because you wanted to be outside, I recognize that. It was just a decision we had to be make. And so our outdoor service planning committee made the decision. We went ahead and scheduled our next outdoor service. It will be June, I'm sorry, January 8th. Uh, so January 8th of this year, uh, we will be having our next outdoor service. And you might be wondering, well, well who's the head of this committee? Uh, you might notice on the slide behind me, uh, it would be John Nicholas. Uh, he sent me this text and let me know, hey, Roddy, it's 55 degrees in Alaska. It's really nice. Thanks, John. For those of you who are first-time guests with us today, I uh, just want to thank you for being with us. We're so glad you chose to be with us. This is a different service for us. We brought everybody inside. You're going to hear a lot of noises in here that we don't typically hear because that's the kids are in here. And uh, we're glad the kids are here. For those of you parents, if your kid gets a little crazy, feel free to take them out. But uh, we're just glad that you chose to, to be with us today. Uh, first time guest, there's a connection card in the seat back in front of you. I just want to encourage you to fill that out. There's also a QR code that you can scan that's on the, excuse me, that's on the screen. And uh, just uh, drop those in the bucket when you leave. We just are so glad that you chose to be with us. Uh, one announcement that I just want to bring to your attention next I guess that's a Saturday. Next Saturday is our grocery giveaway, and uh, we are still looking to have boxes of groceries purchased. Uh, we're giving away 110 boxes, 40-pound boxes of groceries. Great way for us to reach out into the community. We're also looking for help. If you are interested in helping us with that service uh, on Saturday, you can sign up through the events tab, uh, and there's a QR code where you can let us know that you'd be coming. I have the privilege today to introduce someone who means a lot to me. Uh, as you all know, I came from Clark Summit University before I came down here to CCC, and it's not very often that I get an opportunity to introduce my boss of many years who was there. 
Man, it is so, you should hear it up here. It's crazy. It's, <laughs> uh, Dr. Jim Lytle, uh, or as I call him, Jim, uh, has built into my life immensely over the past decade. Jim served 14 years in South Africa as a missionary before returning to Clark Summit University to serve as the president of the college. It's just my opportunity. I am excited to be able to introduce him to you today. Come on out, Jim. Well, you know how this worked. <laughs> this, this is actually the 24th anniversary of the day that we started our church in South Africa. Okay? And we started it in a student YMCA where uh, I, you know, there's no air conditioning. We had these huge windows behind me and had the same noises in our service as you are hearing right now, and we had some that you don't hear, okay, because we had monkeys outside, uh, and, we, and, we had, and we had an Egyptian ibis called hadidas for the noise that they make while they're doing it. So uh, this is great. And those, those of you, well, I think we'll turn it this way. This could make the notes work better. Those of you, moms and dads, who may be thinking, I'm sure everyone's looking at me because my child is so obstreperous. <laughs> I've always thought obstreperous is a great word. I've never had a chance to use it for the platform before. But <laughs> it's going to be fine. Glad you're here. Glad you're here. <laughs> when we lived overseas down in South Africa, we only had three TV channels. And uh, one day I walked in the living room and made the bad choice of just going to turn the TV on. <coughs> and uh, there was a bulldozer on the TV. And as with this bulldozer, there was no one sitting on it. And it was chasing people. <laughs> I found out that the movie was called Kill Dozer. <laughs> it seems that the bulldozer had hit a buried rock from space, and the rock glowed blue, and the bulldozer glowed blue, and suddenly the bulldozer became murderous. It said, it knows where to look for you and how to find you. Now, this is the kind of movie that a guy like me kind of wants to watch till the end just to see, could the next moment be as bad as this one? I didn't make it through the whole thing. It just seemed like a little touch out of the reach of reality. Although I did notice when I walked in that there is a bulldozer sitting right outside here. <laughs> and let me tell you, if during the service you hear that thing fire up, you may want to leave. <laughs> well, how about this? How many of you have seen a Spider-Man movie? Okay, there's been three series of them, so I figure you would have seen them. Okay. Really? <laughs> Teenage boy, bit by spider. I'm a bit, bit by spider. Bit by spider, suddenly able to shoot juice out of his wrist and fly around New York City. Really? <laughs> How many of those movies did you watch? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Right? You watched them all. <laughs> Here we are. Do I have to ask how many of those you watched, right? All of them, right? Why? Why did you do that? I mean, really, Spider-Man, Tony Stark, not really much more likely than the bulldozer sitting outside firing up. Don't even think about that, by the way. Don't, even, don't think about it. I'm sure it's not going to happen. Hey, Roddy, if you got the keys, no, no. <laughs> the difference between the first slide I showed you with the bulldozer and the last two is there's something in the last two that takes what's absolutely unreal and pulls us in. In the first Spider-Man movie, when... Spider-Man was just, he was tired of it. He was going to give up on it. Nobody liked him. Nobody appreciated what he was doing. He was ready to quit. And Aunt May said to him, Peter, everyone needs a hero. As he was standing in front of a little boy who was discouraged. Everyone needs a hero. And that's what pulls us in. 
mean, when we first meet Tony Stark, an extraordinarily intelligent, entirely self-focused people user, we thought, well, it'd be nice to have a couple of spare billions, right? But we don't want to be like him. But by the time the series was done, he gave himself for all of us. I don't think it really happened, but he gave himself for all of us. See, totally unlikely, but it pulls us in because it says something about what's on the inside of us. I don't think that I've got the best passage in Romans to talk to you about this morning, but let me tell you, it's really, really, really powerful. And if you have your Bible or one in the seat in front of you there, open it up to Romans chapter 15. Find verse 14, because Paul is going to say something about you that some of you are going to have trouble believing. Romans chapter 15, verse 14, Paul says, I myself am convinced, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves, I myself, you yourselves, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with knowledge and competent to instruct one another, yet I have written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again. I don't know about you, but there are times when I begin a thought, and then I stop it, and I chase something else, wonder how it was I got there, then find my way back to where I start. Okay, let me tell you. If you took the book of Romans, it printed out on paper, okay? Okay. And you started in chapter 1 and went on from 1.1 1, 1 to 1.16 and cut it right there and then came to this chapter, chapter 15, and then trimmed it right here at verse 14 and took all the stuff you've been learning about from the middle, if you took all that and put it over here and put those two pieces from chapter 1 and chapter 15 together, it would make perfect sense. Because Paul was saying, hey, folks in Rome... I'm going to go to Spain. I want to stop to see you on the way. And that was it. And in between, you know, there's 15 chapters of the most incredible stuff about salvation that we have any place in the Bible. So, had this thought, talked about something else for all those chapters, here I am back again. So, when I pick up there in verse 14, the Apostle Paul is back with the church, after he said, you know, I, I, I'm convinced about these things for you guys, but you know what? Um, it was still a good thing for me to talk about it. He's going to a new culture, going to a new place. Now, it's pretty clear that a lot of people in the New Testament were involved in what you and I would call church planting, just like you are now, whether you are aware of it or not. A lot of them were involved in church planting. I mean, there was that married couple, Priscilla and Aquila who wound up in nearly every port around the Mediterranean uh, as you watch them go around from place to place, buying a house, starting a church, doing their business, leaving, going on someplace else, Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, there was a, an orator who got saved, a guy named Apollos. Man, could he hold a crowd. And Jesus saved him when Priscilla and Aquila were in town, by the way. And they took him off the side, and Priscilla and Aquila said, okay, you got a lot of this stuff. Let's fill in the blanks so that when God uses the voice that he gave you, extraordinary things can happen. And he became a powerful teacher in the church. Paul planned to start churches. It's all you would know this because that was God's design for him. That's what he was supposed to do. And I am convinced he has a design for you and a design for me. And some of it's very specific and some of it's pretty general. I mean, Roddy said we were missionaries uh, for 14 years, we were, and uh, we absolutely loved it. We never planned to quit doing it, but God had different plans, and He's the sort of God that, that saves us. And so, when we take a look at, did I do that? That's where I wanted to be. <laughs> Let me know if anything else goes on here that's important, okay? I'll, We'll get there in a second, guys. So what, what I wanted you to see here is what Paul's doing is building up what you and I are. And what Paul's doing and asking the Romans to help him with is what Paul wants you and me 
to do. He wants us to send some hope to the world. So right here in this, in this section we're going to zip down through. He's going to capsulize what that hope is. And then he's going to tell us why people like you and me could do it. People as unlikely as a teenager who suddenly can zip around New York City as the web slinger. People as unlikely as an arrogant, self-focused billionaire who would eventually give his life. People like us who look at ourselves and say, I don't think God has any big plans for me. I mean, God may want to bring the gospel to the world, but seriously, when I look at myself, I can't see that I would be part of that. Well, let's take a look at the passage here. We can have that significant impact because of what Paul says there. You know, he wants to send hope to the world because what he's doing is all about the church. If I were to ask you, what's the Roman church like? Some of you would say, well, I don't know. Well, look here. You can tell me what the Roman church is like. Look in verse 14. What's, their, what's the first thing about them? They are brothers and sisters, right? They're family in Christ. They're family in Christ. Now, if your family is like mine, family is great, unless it's not. <clears throat> you know, because it kind of goes back and forth. It's fabulous. What's what family is? There are brothers and sisters. You sometimes scrap with your brother or sister? Of course you do. What's the big surprise if occasionally that happens inside the church? What do you do in your family here? You fix it up. What do you do in your family in the church? You fix it up. I'm convinced of you, Paul says. I'm convinced that you, my brothers and sisters, are full of goodness. thought about doing this, but I wasn't sure. I mean, what, just to do the what if. What, what, we won't do the real thing. What, what if I ask you to, you know, we're taking something off out of Roddy's page here, right? If I ask you to look at the person next to you and say, you are full of goodness. Now, let me tell you, I was a pastor long enough to know that there's probably some people sitting in a group this size that would struggle to turn their head because the problem's going on. But it's still true. You ever give somebody the benefit of the doubt when you don't want to give them the benefit of the doubt? Yeah, it should happen like all the time. All the time. Because if Jesus is inside somebody, you are full of goodness. Are you perfect? Of course not. You're not dead yet. Okay, when you get to be dead, you're going to get to be perfect. In between now and then, you're going to be full of goodness. How about this, this next characteristic? Brothers and sisters, full of goodness. See what the next one is here in the text? Filled with what? Knowledge. Filled with knowledge. Okay, now you're really in trouble. Because a number of you wives are not going to turn your head and look at the husband and say, you're full of knowledge. Because on the way in this morning, you were saying, you're an idiot. <laughs> but this is what Paul thought about these people. Were they full of all knowledge like God? Of course not. Of course not. But they were full of goodness, full of knowledge. And what's the last one we have here? And competent to instruct one another. The best teachers in the world? No. But competent. See, Paul really thought that you and I should be able to play into each other's lives in a way that will help each other grow in Christ. Now, some of you there, uh, you have your arms crossed because you're cold. I'm sure it's the air conditioning. Others of you may have your arms crossed because you're saying, I'm not sure I can buy it. My whole life, I spent having to uncross my arms when I read the Bible. Because what the Bible says is true, whether I think it is or not. When I look at the church we planted beginning 24 years ago today, when I look at the church that we're part of now, which is one of our supporting churches, when we were there, and when I look at you, it would be easier based on our experiences with each other, based on the times we got kicked in the shins, based on the struggles of sin in our lives, it would be easier to say, you're losers. But then it'd be more honest to say, we're losers. More honest yet to say, I think I'm the loser. 
But what Paul says is this. What Paul says. He says, you're competent to instruct one another. I've written you boldly because you got to fill in the blanks a bit. But you know, how about this? This is what some of you have been around here for a while. If I said, which book in the New Testament recounts is Paul's letter to the problem church? A lot of you say 1 Corinthians. Look at this. Look at what he says. Paul says, I give thanks to my God always for you. Why? Look at that. Because the grace of God that was given you in Jesus Christ, that in every way, every way you were enriched in all speech and all knowledge, even as the testimony of Christ was present, was growing, confirmed among you, so that you are not, you are not lacking in any gift. And would you have said that about the Corinthians? See, Paul said in Timothy that the church is the church of the living God. It is a pillar and a buttress. That's the thing that leans against the wall, the European cathedrals to hold the walls up. A buttress, something that strengthens something else. The church is a pillar and a buttress of truth. So in that first slide when I talked about that the church is what God is using. The church is God's way of doing this. This would have been a better slide. Because when Paul wants to send hope to the world, it's not just me and you and we hook up hands going you know, like that. You've seen lines like that, right? It's this. It's that we form an interconnected bunch of relationships that makes a difference. So that's why when I say the church is the hope of the world, I've got Bible for that. But this is what I want you to see. I want you to see the Cocalico Community Church is the hope of the world. You say, little us? No. You're the hope of the world. You're the hope of the part of the world you're touching right here. You're the hope of the part of the world that you're touching through prayer and through finances outside there. You're the hope of the world. And all of a sudden, we're back to Peter Parker and Tony Stark. Me? Us? No, no, you were thinking of that other church down there that, that has like 20 locations and they're bringing in $800,000 a week. You're thinking about them. That, that, that's the church. That's the church that would be able to send hope to the world. They, could, they got the power for that. They got more staff than we do. They got more people than we do. They could pull that off. The church in Rome was a bunch of people living in one of the most oppressed cities in the empire, meeting in small houses. And you saw what Paul said about them, that the church is the hope of the world. You, you got to see it. You got to see it. Now, when we look here and recognize, let's get down to verse 16, let's say, eh, 15 again. I've written to you quite boldly on some points to remind you of them again because of the grace God gave me. It's this job to be a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. He gave me the priestly duty. That sounds like Old Testament, doesn't it? The priestly duty of proclaiming the gospel of God so Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. You see, when, when God wants to send the word, the gospel, hope to the world, he uses these kind of people, and he uses this kind of guy. You're going to find in the end of the book of Romans, when you get there, two or three weeks, I suppose, that Paul asks prayer for two relatives of his who were in the Lord before him. You know who Paul was before the Lord saved him, right? He was a, a leader among the Jews. He was a Pharisee who spent his life persecuting the church, even to the point of killing some people in the church. I mean, if he was your cousin, would you even bother to pray for him? I mean, you look at a guy like Saul of Tarsus, you say, well, God's not going to save him. Man, he hates us. He hates everything we're about. I, I want to pray for somebody else. But still, the apostle Paul came out of Saul. One of my friends put up on Facebook this week a posting that said that when, when Saul of Tarsus, when Paul entered heaven, 
he was greeted by the cheers of the martyrs whom he had killed. That's what the gospel does. That's what the gospel does. And so Paul says, I, I'm a minister of Christ Jesus to the Gentiles. The priestly duty. A priest is one who links God and man. He gave me the priestly duty of giving out the gospel of God. So the Gentiles might become an offering acceptable to God. Offering acceptable. Does that... Does that strike you? Can you think of another passage in Romans, an offering acceptable to God? It's Romans 12, 1 and 2, right? I beseech you, brothers, based on the mercy of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable to God, which is your spiritual or reasonable service of worship. All the stuff here in this part of Romans goes back to Romans 12, 1 and 2. An offering acceptable to God, sanctified by the Holy Spirit. People like that, yeah, people like that with the Spirit of God inside of them. And the reason that Paul sends hope to the world through the church is because the church is all about the gospel. Paul says in verse 17, therefore, I glory in Christ Jesus in my service to God. I will not venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done. When I looked out over the congregation at Bethany Church down there in Durban, some people who I knew well, because we'd actually we got together with a bunch of couples, and Diane and I, we started a, a Bible study on marriage. I discovered that a lot of the folks who come to marriage Bible studies have needs. Maybe you wouldn't have chosen them if you were thinking clearly to be the core of your church. But you know what? Jesus worked in them. It was the gospel. It was the good news. That when Jesus Christ died on the cross, He died there in our place. He died there for our sins and He rose from the dead. We sang about that this morning, okay? He rose from the dead so we could walk in new life. That's the way it worked. <clears throat> The work that I'm calling you guys to do, God sends hope to the church, and the church is all about the gospel. What I'm asking you to do is think about the fact that it's not the spider bite that created the goo that came out of the wrist. It's not the incredible brain that created the flying iron suit. When we talk about stuff, it's the Spirit of God. It's Him inside of us. You say, is he really there? If the Word of God is true, he is. Either it's true or it's not. I'm going for true. Right? It's the work of the Spirit of God, verse 17. I will glory in Christ in my service to God. I won't venture to speak of anything except what Christ has accomplished through me in leading the Gentiles to obey God by what I've said and done. You're not perfect. But some of you here this morning are a great deal more perfect than you were. You are. And you can look back now on the way you were absolutely destroying a perfectly good life because you didn't know the gospel. You didn't have the Spirit. And now it's a struggle, like every day, but you're moving ahead. The, the, the church is all about the gospel. Paul says, verse 19, by the power of signs and wonders... Uh, 2 Corinthians 12, Paul talks about the signs of an apostle. Uh, in the Old Testament, both with Moses and Joshua and with Elijah and Elisha, New Testament, Jesus and the apostles, all three of those, there was extraordinary works done by the first and extraordinary works done by the second. And by the time you get to the end of the New Testament era there in the first century, you've got the, the uh, apostle John saying at the, in the 20th chapter, Gospel of John, he says, Jesus did many more things that are written down in this book, many more signs, but these are written down so that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ and that you believing might have life in His name. In the Word of God, we got enough. Paul didn't have the whole Word of God. He had signs and wonders. Signs and wonders through the power of the Spirit of God, leading, guiding, amazing things. 
He said, so from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of Christ. In case you didn't bring your map along with you this morning, there's your map of the Mediterranean. Over there on the right-hand side, let's see, does this thing have a pointer on it? Nah, the pointers never work. On the right-hand side, let me go over here and stand. Just, just above me here, you see the word Jerusalem, right? Okay. Paul says, I started here in Jerusalem. And then he proclaimed the gospel. And he went up into what we call Turkey. All those, all those weird names back then. You see right above my hand the word Tarsus right there, kind of in the middle. Paul's hometown. Places like Cilicia and Galatia and Asia and Bithynia and Pontus and Thrace and Macedonia that we call Greece. Okay? And then you see right here in the middle, kind of purpley one, where it says Illyricum, right? Paul says, from Jerusalem all the way through Illyricum, I have fully proclaimed the gospel of God. Who was he writing to? He was writing to the people in Rome. You see the boot there, right? You see the Italian peninsula and you see the city of Rome there because he was planning to go on to, on the far left, Hispania, to Spain. You see, Paul didn't stop in every city all through Turkey and all that, and Greece, he didn't do that. No. What he did was what you guys started doing back in the 90s. Put a church here. And the church echoes out and touches the whole area. Paul said, I've done what I'm supposed to do. I got churches going because church is where the Spirit of God works. I got churches going because that's where God changes lives. Because people like those four qualities at the very beginning of the passage, when they get together, they don't need an apostle anymore. They got the Word of God. They got the Spirit of God. They can work on this. All those impossible people around here, they're your responsibility. Well, you and the Spirit of God, and you and the Word of God, it works just the same whether you got an apostle here or not. And so Paul says, from Jerusalem all the way around to Illyricum, I've fully preached the gospel. And uh, really, I I kind of like to go to Spain. I've fully preached it. It's always been my ambition, he says, in verse 20, to preach the gospel where Christ was not known. So I wouldn't be building on somebody else's foundation. And then he heads off into the Old Testament. Rather, it's written, those who were not told about him will see. Those who've not heard will understand. That's why I've been often hindered from coming to you. You see, Paul measured the worth of his work based on the work of the Spirit of God in the lives of people like you and me. Just check here. 24th, right? Okay, so 47 years, 9 months, and 26 days ago, we got married. And look at me now. Perfect. Well, my wife will not have an opportunity to give a rebuttal from the microphone, um, but better. It's been a process. Really, it's been a process. And we're supposed to honor Jesus just like those Gentiles did by responding to His Word. I mean, in, in a group like this, I mean, we're spread out here, we're in the room back there, we're online. In a group like this, I mean... There has got to be some folks here who are super struggling with their marriage. Uh, there's got to be some folks here who have just about all but given up on our kids. There's got to be some people here who are struggling with stuff they know beyond a shadow of a doubt is wrong because the Bible's clear. They know that, but they just can't stop struggling with it. In spite of Diane's ministry to me, which has been fabulous over all these years, any unsolved problems in my life aren't her fault. They are simply areas where I have not submitted to the good news. Remember what got Paul on his digression back there in chapter 1? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ because it is the what? Do you know? It's the power of God. Say that word. It's the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. The Jew first and also the Gentile. 
because through the gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed. And my problems are just like your problems, okay? If you're sitting there right now thinking, well, this is a little bit too more personal than I thought the service was going to be. The, the problems that we have are problems that we have not brought to the Word of God and said, what do I do about this? Or they're problems where we say, well, that would never work, which is back to killdozer. That never worked. Instead of the power of God that brings salvation. Saw a cartoon once. Two guys ice fishing. One of them has a standard ice fishing hole, right? The kind of ice fishing hole where you would likely would catch the sort of fish that I catch. Like that. The other guy has a hole cut in the shape of a whale that goes out to the horizon. I guess it depends on what you're fishing for. On the very first Sunday that we met, our church met, of course, in rented facilities. We're right next to a teacher's college. South Africa they used to do teaching, teacher colleging stuff at institutions that weren't wrapped up in universities. They were just changing that. On the very first Sunday, a young woman came who wanted to be a kindergarten teacher. Her name was Taryn. Uh, she was Afrikaans, and uh, we, in the province, we were in a formerly British province down there where we lived, but there was a lot of Afrikaans and Zulu and Indian people there, and it was, it was fabulous. It was fabulous. I miss it all the time. And so there was Taryn, and she was trained to be a kindergarten teacher, and let me tell you, for my American ears, we were told many times down there, you don't speak English, you speak American, okay? So to my American ears, her Afrikaans accent was, what'd you say? Well, she was already born again. She started to grow in the Lord. It was just amazing to watch her grow. She graduated from teacher's college. She went off to be uh, a kindergarten teacher, joined one of the other churches in our fellowship of churches, and was teaching there. And as she taught there, she became more and more aware of what the needs of the world are. And Taryn decided to take a job teaching English to kindergarten students in Beijing. We all put money together for her, and she went and did it for years. I always figured that I would, if I ever met one of those kids here in America, I would know them right away by the way their English sounded. And there she was, going to a place I've always wanted to go to, sending hope to the world because she looked at herself and said, well, why shouldn't I do that? If there is a Word of God, if there is a Spirit of God, if what Paul said about a church like the Roman church was true, it's true about me. We can make this work. And if you came here this morning thinking this couldn't be true, it is true. You need to hang around here long enough to let folks help you. You need to be open enough to let the gospel work on your problems, okay? Because God's plan is to send hope to the world. And as unlikely as it seems, there's some Peter Parkers here. There's some Tony Starks here. There's probably a Wonder Woman or two. Because that's the way God does it. Let's pray together. Lord, thank you for being the God who cares, who loves, and who does absolutely unlikely things. And Lord, I would ask that you would help us this morning to be those kind of people. And for the folks, Lord, who've never responded to the gospel of Christ, I ask you to give them some grace this morning to do it. Help them to see the truth and what your plan is and where you're going to take them. Probably some other folks here, Lord, who walked in uh, with problems bigger than they could solve. And so I would ask that you would help them this morning to be humble enough to open up the Word of God. And Lord, I would also ask that if they haven't got a clue where to open it, that you'd let them be humble enough to ask for help. Lord, I'm so grateful for this church. I'm so grateful they're the kind of people who are full of goodness. And I'm grateful they're well able to teach one another. And I would ask you to help them to become more and more brothers and sisters in Christ. That as a group, 
they'd be able to bring hope to this part of the world. And Lord, I ask that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Let's stand together and sing one more song today.
Let's pray together this morning as we close this service. Father, we thank you so much. Your mercy is so much more. God, it's the power. It's your power that makes us the hope of the world, Father. You give us that power so freely. And we're so privileged and honored and humbled to be your hands and your feet in this world. So God, as we go, help us to remember that CCC is the hope of the world. That we represent this church, we represent your body, your bride. Not just today, not just on Sunday, but all throughout the week. As we share the gospel and the good news with those around us. Thank you for your mercy, Lord. Thank you for your power. Thank you for all that you do for us. And it's in Jesus' mighty name that we pray and thank you. Amen. Well, CCC, thanks for coming out to our outdoor, indoor service. Uh, we hope you have a great afternoon. Uh, stay cool. And uh, we do have some uh, drinks in the back. We purchased some drinks for the outdoor service, uh, but we brought them here for you today. So take uh, an ice cold beverage and uh, go with God. Thank you. You are dismissed. Cause that's the power of your name It just a mission makes a way Giants fall and strongholds break And there is healing And that's the power that I claim It's the same that rolled the grave And there's no power like the mighty name of Jesus Your power is dangerous.